Hello, and welcome back to Data Science CastNet. There's been a few really good new diffusion models come onto the block recently, um, all describing different ways of improving their results. So we had DALI 3, really, really fancy, showing off lots of understanding, uh, improving image generation with better captions. And then we had Facebook's EMU model, enhancing image generation models using photogenic needles in a haystack. Uh, there's also been various efforts to fine-tune existing models with more advanced techniques, so lots of work on reinforcement learning from human feedback or human preferences, on stable diffusion, um, the newer Virchen models from um, Dominic and Pablo and others, um, scaling up and using more efficient architectures and efficient training. Um, so lots and lots of work on trying to create better models. And so I'd like to create a few videos diving into those techniques but before we do that, we have to kind of address the elephant in the room, which is how do you evaluate these models? What is the way for me to say, oh, my model is better than this model? Because historically, we've had measurements such as FID, which is um, like a measure of how similar two distributions are in, in the space of an image model. It's a very technical measure of like image fidelity, uh, but not necessarily perfect in terms of actually applying to these models. And in fact, some more recent works have found that it's kind of almost an anti-signal once you get good enough. Um, you may have a better FID than someone else, but a worse model by all like objective measures. And so the gold standard that you'll see in a lot of these papers is user evaluation, right? This figure here, figure one in the Stable Diffusion XL paper, this is the one introducing the larger, better version of Stable Diffusion, comparing user preferences between SDXL versus Stable Diffusion 1.5 and 2.1. And they show, given two images for the same prompt, which of these is better. They ask real human beings for their preference. Um, and this is the same for something like Facebook's EMU model. Um, when they're evaluating this, they're going to say, what is the human evaluation results, right? We show um, humans the image and we say, OK, please give us the visual appeal. Which of these two is better? Uh, the text faithfulness, which of these two is better? The um, you know, for different sets of prompts and different models and so on. So that's really the gold standard, is to put these images in front of someone and say, if you had to choose one, which would it be? Because ultimately, like happy users, if you're designing a product for users, that's going to be a really good metric. But we can't necessarily do that, right? We don't have vast swathes of users at our disposal, unless you're a large company. Um, and maybe you're wanting to just test out some different things yourself, and you don't want to sit there rating tons of images. I can highly recommend it, but it does get time consuming. OK, so th this whole video today is going to be looking at a couple of alternatives, um, focusing on a really nice a data set and model called Pick a Pick and the model being PickScore. Um, and so what this is trying to do is take this idea of scoring an image and turn it into um, something that we can run without necessarily having to put the images in front of users. And the end result of this is going to be something like this, where we can um, take different models, um, run them through our scoring pipeline, and get a single value that tries to capture how well does this model do, right? The base model versus the fine-tuned model, or trying different styles and settings. Um, and we can also compare this across different like hyperparameters of sampling. Um, so let's dive into code, and let's run through some examples here. And I'll share this notebook down below somewhere. Um, so to test, uh, let's just run, I'm just going to restart. Um, we're going to load up a stable diffusion pipeline. And for arbitrary reasons, I've decided on stable diffusion 2.1. You could switch in your own version. Um, you could try this on some different model. Um, or like I'll show, we can use this to compare between different models. OK, so I have a pipeline. I can type in a prompt, a photo of an astronaut riding a horse on Mars. And we're going to get back an image that ideally matches that prompt. So the question is, how do we score this? Um, one metric that's fairly popular in terms of how does the image follow the prompt is to use clip. Clip is a model from OpenAI, and then there's lots of open variants of it that gives us a similarity score between an image and a piece of text. Right, So it's trained on images with captions, and it gives us a kind of alignment between the two. Um, clip has some downsides. It's not great at verbs. It's just good at looking for objects or components in a picture. Um, but in general, it gives us a pretty robust score for how well is my model following the prompt. Um, a high score might be you know, 33, 35, 38. A low score might be um, something like 15 or 20. Um, and this is just like a um, cosine similarity between the embedding of the image and the embedding of the text, um, scaled and tweaked. 
Um, okay, so this is going to give us one measure, and um, it's, it's pretty useful. Um, here is a figure from the Stable Diffusion Excel paper plotting FID, which is okay for measuring like image quality in, in some ways, but definitely not aligned with human preferences, and as we'll see, actually kind of, yeah, not ideal at all. Um, but still, we can treat this as like how, you know, how high quality is the image by this very technical metric um, versus how well do we match the prompt according to CLIP. And you can see as we go from a sampling um, classifier free guidance scale of one over at the left, when we bump that up to three, we get higher FID, higher CLIP, that's great. Um, as we increase that guidance, as we enforce the prompt more and more, we get higher CLIP scores. In other words, the image looks more and more and more like our prompt. Um, but the FID score can start to go down. And even the um, human preferences will start to go down at some point, although it's usually at a higher CFG scale than any of the automated metrics. Um, and so this is pretty useful for comparing to say, if you want to say SDXL follows the prompt better than SD2.1, um, you can say, that, oh, for equivalent guidance scales, the SDXL model tends to get a higher clip score. Um, well, in this case, it's a slightly lower FID score. Um, so that's a really nice measure for prompt following specifically. And there's lots of different clip model variants. Some of the large ones might be more accurate. Um, but yeah, that's one tool in our arsenal. And it's very interesting to see the trade-offs of this clip score versus some of the other scores we'll look at. Then the big one that I want to focus on today, this is the one that I'll be using in some follow-up videos on fine-tuning as the like core metric that we care about, besides the, the true like gold standard user preference. Um, that's going to be pick score. And so pick score comes from this project, like I said, the pick a pick project. Um, I'll go back to the paper. What they did is they created a web interface where users could type in a prompt and they get back a number of images. And on the back end, those would be generated by different models. So maybe one image is generated by an early alpha version of Stable Diffusion XL. Another image is generated by Stable Diffusion 2.1. A third is generated by some like user popular user fine tune, like um, photoreal diffusion or whatever of Stable Diffusion 1.5, dreamlike photoreal is one of the examples they give. Um, so you get two images, or you get a grid of images, and you can either choose, oh, I really like this one on the right, or um, no, no image is significantly better, it's call it a tie. So they collected a large data set of these, um, these image rankings, as it were, and then they train a model on top of that. Um, so yeah, gathered hundreds of thousands of rankings, lots and lots of different images. Um, and that platform itself was a great way for people to test these kind of user preferences directly, right? They could try behind the scenes different uh, classifier free guidance scales and say which ones tended to win, which ones tended to lose, what, what's an ideal setting. Um, they could also try different models. Stream like Photoreal tended to win against the um, Stable Diffusion 2.1. So they could do this like head to head comparison of two models. Um, so very, very useful. We don't have access to that, or at least it's, it's tricky to get an experiment up on there. Um, but we do have the next best thing, which is a score model trained on those ratings. So this gives something that predicts a, a number, um, which tends to correlate fairly well with human experts and do a lot better than other um, image evaluation models, at least at the time. There's been some good ones since, um, in terms of accuracy matching what the user actually selected versus what the, um, what the model predicts the user will select. And so, let's see, yeah, good correlation between the pick score preference and the user preference, um, or ELO in this case. So how do we actually use that model? Um, back into the notebook, um, we can load it up. It looks very similar to a clip model internally um, built on transformers. We can load in the model, and um, then they provide a get scores function, which if you look at it is just processing the inputs and for the images and the text, embedding them, and then comparing the embeddings. So basically like some sort of um, very, very similar metric to the clip score that we looked at earlier. Um, and with the scoring function, we can pass in that image that we generated and a prompt, and we can see what the score is. 22.66, that's a pretty good score um, according to this model. Whereas if the prompt had been something unrelated, like a, a photo of a pretty flower, again, we'd expect a much lower score, and we do see that. Um, and so, yeah, this gives us a, another, another measure that we can use to evaluate our models. The units are kind of arbitrary. Um, but all that we care about is that higher means better. And so this gives us something that we can then use given two models and we want to compare them. The actual data set is also available. You can get the images or the prompts. Um, yeah, and so we might as well use this as a source for 
some small set of prompts that we can test. And these are submitted by users, so there's some really funny ones in there, some dodgy ones in there, fair warning. Um, but yeah, what this sets us up to do is to run different experiments. So I, I have an example here. Um, I have some different guidance scales that I'd like to try. And for each of those guidance scales, I'll run through um, 50 prompts. And you could choose a larger number if you had more time and you wanted more accurate results. You could choose a smaller number if you only wanted to get a quick result out. Um, so let's maybe just go 2, 9, and 20. I think I ran this before, but I didn't. I went up to, to 12 only. Um, okay, five prompts each, so this is going to be a very rough measure. Uh, one thing that's important is I'm setting the seed according to like which prompt we're looking at, just so that when we do two different things we're comparing, the only thing that's changing is that one value. We're not changing the seed, we're not changing the number of steps, you're not changing anything else, just that one parameter that we're interested in. Um, and that's going to give us a way to directly compare. Still not ideal to only do five prompts, obviously I recommend more like 100. Um, but yeah, this is going to give us a very quick way to say, oh, I'd like to try, you know, maybe this is different numbers of sampling steps or different samplers or different models or different fine tunes of a single model. Um, this just gives us a way to quickly compare, um, go across the same prompts, the same seeds, different models, see which one does better. Um, and as we'll see, hopefully in a few minutes or a few seconds rather, um, we'll get a little plot where we can start to pick out exactly what's going on. Um, so. 10 more seconds. Here we go. Okay, so in this case, the score continuously increases for our guidance scale of 2 up to, to 9, up to 20. Um, there may be, yeah, some extremes the higher you go. And in general, the further away from anything that the model saw during training, the pick score model, the less reliable it's going to be. Um, and so if you go and have a look at the kinds of settings and the kinds of models they used, it's going to be fairly well calibrated for that. I don't know that it necessarily will extend to maybe some totally different type of sampling and model at some different resolution um, with a different like data set that it was trained on. You want to be a little bit careful with this that you're training. But if, if for example, you're comparing two different versions of stable diffusion, while well, it was trained on a bunch of different versions of stable diffusion, that's probably a safe bet. Um, okay, so we've got the score model. We can do, do different experiments. Um, I can show you the script that I'm using um, here where I just have a lot of that code converted into a script and I'm using weights and biases to log um, the scores. So we run through again some number of prompts using the same seed for each. Uh, we have a smaller number of prompts to test some different uh, CFG scales and different number of steps. Um, and then I can just call this script here um, to specify a model name. Um, so for example, stable diffusion 1.5, and that'll log and create this um, evaluation dashboard. Um, specifically, it'll look something like this, um, where we get the score for each model we've run, um, a a along with the score for different numbers of steps. So more sampling steps is generally better, but there's a, um, a drop-off where it's not really worth going from 40 to 70, for example. The score doesn't increase that much. Likewise, for the guidance scale, um, as the scale increases, the score tends to get better and then worse again. Some models, it gets better earlier and then drops off. Um, so for a given model, your optimal settings might not necessarily be the same as those for other models. It's really nice to be able to run these sweeps, figure out what a good combinations of settings are um, for your particular fine tune or your particular application. Um, okay, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to show in this video. A quick one, hopefully. Um, we'll use this in future videos to try our own fine tunes with some different techniques and see how good we can get um, based on different models. But it is really fun to see that, oh yeah, um, we have a way to evaluate um, that is at least a, a reasonable signal um, based on, on a model that's trained on user preferences. It's like one step away from the gold standard. So I hope you found that interesting. Stick around for future videos where we try and increase our score. Um, even good old stable diffusion 1.5, we'll see how good we can get that with some newer techniques. Um, yeah, so we'll see you in the next video for that.